This is for the visionaries, the change agents, explorers, and dreamers. Those who see the world of medicine not as it is, but for what it could be. It's to them that we at Sonosite dedicate our own vision. A vision of how outcomes can be bettered, how lives can be changed, how the human touch can be optimized. It's what drives us to see you behind every scan, every day, every crucial minute or precious second. From the moment we dedicated ourselves to point of care ultrasound technology more than 20 years ago, you, the men and women on the front lines of modern medicine, have been our inspiration. You have inspired every screen, every transducer, every wheelbase, every workflow, every button and knob, or lack thereof. The way you move, the way you think, the way you care. In measures both subtle and large, your skill gave our product skill. Your genius gave them genius. Your heart gave them heart. At Sonosite, we never forget who's behind the scan. And we're behind you every step of the way. Welcome to the next. Clarity and confidence comes to light. Meet Sonosite PX. Fujifilm Sonosite. Any patient, anywhere, anytime. Hello and welcome to the Fujifilm Sonosite webinar discussing practical sports ultrasound with Dr. Tark Awan. My name is Daniel Shelton, Director of Musculoskeletal Market Development here at Fujifilm Sonosite. I'm pleased to announce the arrival of the new Sonosite PX ultrasound system featuring the new 19 megahertz linear array transducer. The format of the webinar is a quick high-level overview of common sports ultrasound applications with scanning demonstration, immediately followed by a live Q&A session featuring the ultrasound scan along. In an effort to keep a clean recording for the presentation, please hold your questions to the end of the presentation and have them ready for the live Q&A session with Dr. Tarek Awan. Tarek Awan, DO, is a board-certified family medicine and sports medicine physician. Dr. Awan is highly experienced in providing non-operative orthopedic care ranging from recreational to professional athletes. Clinically, he treats multiple musculoskeletal conditions and sports injuries of the extremities and has a particular interest in chronic tendon disorders, osteoarthritis, musculoskeletal ultrasound for interventional procedures, and the use of cell-based therapies. He has previous team physician experience with the University of Michigan Athletics and the NHL's Detroit Red Wings. As a part of his duties with Advent Health Medical Group, he serves as the team physician for the NBA's Orlando Magic. Welcome, Dr. Awan. I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Daniel, for that introduction. Uh, it's great to be here with everyone as we talk about uh, practical sports ultrasound and how to incorporate sports ultrasound into your practice. So this is the agenda we're going to go over. So those couple of the topics we're going to review are incorporating sports ultrasound into your practice, some of the advantages and disadvantages of ultrasound, the sports application of ultrasound and routine scans with demonstration, and then we'll also have some time for question and answer, question, excuse me, questions, questions and answers with a live ultrasound uh, demonstration. So uh, please type your questions in the chat portal or hold them until the end. Uh, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. So sports ultrasound, there are numerous advantages to ultrasound in general. The soft tissue resolution is, is quite remarkable. And for certain structures, the, the resolution is actually better than MRI, especially for looking at superficial tendons. Uh, you also have the advantage of neurovascular vis visualization, which adds another la layer of safety when you're doing procedures. Uh, there's no radiation. You have real-time image. It's cost-effective compared to some of the other modalities. And then the other nice thing about ultrasound is you actually have the contralateral side for comparison. So if you're scanning a structure such as the shoulder and the elbow and you're not sure it's pathology, you can go and scan the other side for comparison. Uh, a lot of these units are small, so they're portable. You can take them with you to various clinics or to the sidelines. And another nice feature of ultrasound is, is the ability to do dynamic maneuvers. So you can use this to help enhance your diagnosis. 
and, and their further evaluation of structures to see how they respond to stress or, or dynamic maneuver. So what we have here is um, evaluation of the rotator cuff and long axis plane. So you can see here, um, this is the bony acoustic landmark of the proximal humerus. Here's the supraspinatus tendon and long axis. Uh, you have the edge of the acromion right here. So when the patient abducts her shoulders, we can see how the supraspinatus um, uh, clears the acromion here. So this is a dynamic maneuver for impingement. So despite the numerous advantages of sports ult ultrasound, there are some disadvantages. Uh, ultrasound is one of those modalities where it's very operator dependent. There's also a lot of variability in the quality of the machines. Uh, newer machines uh, are, are much better in terms of soft tissue resolution. The technology of some of the machines have really improved over the last uh, many years. Um, now the other issue with the ultrasound is for deeper structures and body habitus may be difficult to see. So while ultrasound is an excellent modality for superficial structures and tendons, there are limitations for looking intra-articular, so looking in joints, whether it's shoulder, hip, or knee, there are limitations and deeper structures. And, and with ultrasound, you're limited by bone as well. You, you, you can't penetrate through bone. So the, the other uh, uh, beauty of ultrasound that lends itself to sports practices is, is being able to do office-based procedures. So when you're, when you're planning to do procedures, an ultrasound setup is very important because if you're gonna to try to do this efficiently, um, uh, doing procedures while you're seeing patients in the clinical setting, having, having a system um, so you could do things in a, an efficient manner, um, it can really, can really make the day go smoother. So when you're setting up procedures, you wanna make sure you have good clinical support and help. Uh, you want to pay attention to ergonomics. You want to make sure that your patient and the machine are in front of you so you don't have to look over your shoulder. You want to optimize the settings on the Elchon machine. When you're doing procedures, you're going to scan with your non-dominant hand and then your dominant hand to do the procedure. And I always recommend having an assistant in there uh, with you because if you're doing things sterile and whatnot, having someone to help with any patient-related issues or adjusting settings on the machine. So I just think it's a good idea for uh, patient setup and flow to have someone in there with you. Um, so here's here's some slides that show the the example of the soft tissue resolution of ultrasound. So whether you're looking at adipose muscle tendon ligaments bursa nerves capsule or cartilage, the the soft tissue resolution is really quite remarkable. If you look here in the upper uh, left hand portion, we have the distal portion of the patellar tendon. So this is proximal. This is distal. This bony acoustic landmark is the tibial, tibial tuberosity. You could see here this nice hyperechoic uh, fibular structure of, of the distal patellar tendon. And contrast what, what you see, how a tendon looks like to the echo signature of muscle. So muscles uh, is gonna be relatively hypoechoic with hyperechoic separation from the epimesium of the muscle. So this here is the gastroc and soleus junction here. And we have a ligament here. This is actually the medial elbow, proximal, distal, this is the ulnotrochlear joint, and this is the anterior band of the ulnar collateral ligament. So this is the proximal portion, this is the distal portion, this is the insertion on the subline tubercle here, and you have the ulnar humeral joint here. So again, the, the soft tissue resolution of looking at some of these structures is quite remarkable. And then over here, we have actually, this is a, a sagittal view or a long axis view of the radial capitellar joint. So again, this is proximal, this is distal. You can make out the characteristic bony acoustic landmark here of the radial head. Here's the capitellum. And notice this hypochoic stripe here, this is actually the articular cartilage. So again, you can make out all these structures uh, based on their echo signature um, with the ultrasound. So this, this type of resolution and image quality is, is quite remarkable. So this is an example here of a triceps tendon. So not only can you visualize tendinosis, but with some features of these ultrasound machines, such as Doppler activity, you can also visualize hyperemia. So this is probe positioning uh, for looking at the triceps tendon from proximal to distal. This is the corresponding ultrasound. So this is proximal, this is distal. So you can make out the tendon here. You can see how thickened and swollen it is. And this is actually the olecranon fossa, this little, this little valley. So this is a, a long axis view of the uh, triceps tendon. And coming here with the Doppler fe feature, you could see when we put the Doppler on, you can see the increased hyperemia here in the tendon. 
And there's also calcification here. So you can see there's some sort of interest tendinous calcification or, or in the uh, superior aspect of the tendon. And one thing of calcification, sometimes they'll get posterior acoustic shadowing. So you can see here, this isn't a, a defect or a tear in the tendon, but this is actually posterior acoustic shadowing from this calcium here because the ultrasound beam um, aren't penetrating through this, through this almost like bone structure that's, that's here in the superficial portion of the tendon. So again, you know, the ultrasound, you're able to, to see all these uh, nuances, whether it's Doppler activity, the, the impact of calcification, the thickening, the thickening and swelling of the tendon. So there's a, there's a lot of information you can glean. So the other nice uh, aspect of ultrasound that we touched on earlier is the dynamic nature of it. If you're looking at a structure such as the ulnar collateral ligament in the medial elbow, you can put stress and you can see what happens to the joint. So this is a case of a 16 year old uh, right hand dominant pitcher that was having medial elbow pain. Uh, he had typical exam findings of the um, ulnar collateral ligament with stressing and milking maneuver. And you look here, this is the MRI. So here, you, this is a, a coronal view of the MRI and you can make out here the anterior band of the ulnar collateral ligament. So the ligament is intact. And this is the corresponding ultrasound uh, with stress. So again, proximal, distal, this is the medial epicondyle, this is the ulnar humeral joint here, and this is this structure here is the anterior band of the ulnar collateral ligament. So this is a coronal view attaching on the subline tubercle. Look here at the joint space here. So they, with the ultrasound machine, we could actually use calipers and measure the space. This is the contralateral side. So again, the nice thing about ultrasound, you have a normal comparison on the opposite side. So you can quickly scan the opposite side, uh, put the images side by side. And, and this is the, the left elbow or the contralateral side. And you can see the difference in the, again, this is proximal, this is distal. Here's the anterior band of the under collateral ligament. This is the medial epicondyle. This is the uh, trochlea and the, and the humerus here. And again, this is the ulnar humeral joint. So look at the distance here between the, ul the uh, ulna and the uh, humerus versus the distance here. So again, you have the, you have the opposite side as your normal control. So, you, so using the contralateral side and also stress maneuvers can help with this diagnosis. So the other thing that ultrasound is being uh, increasingly used for, especially when, when you're in an area such as the sidelines or where you, where you don't have immediate um, access to x-ray is looking at fractures. So you can see the cortex and periosteum very nicely uh, because of the soft tissue resolution is, is, is phenomenal with ultrasound. So this is an example of a wrist uh, forearm buckle fracture. This is a pediatric fracture. So it was a nine-year-old baseball player that fell while running the bases. And he had uh, uh, extreme tenderness of the dorsal aspect of the wrist. So this is Again, proximal, this is distal. You can make out the, the growth plate here. So again, you know, the image qualities in the resolution is, is second to none here. This is with the 15 megahertz probe. This is with the 19 megahertz probe. So if you see here along the cortex, you can see here there's a little, there's a little a break or disruption in the cortex that you see here. And again, on the 19 megahertz probe, you can see there's a little blister or a, or a little uh, disruption in the cortex. And, and this, uh, uh, buckle fracture was confirmed with radiographs as well. So now we're going to get into the live scanning. We're going to start with the shoulder protocol. So the shoulder is one of those uh, structures that based on the guidelines and recommendations, you want to do a complete exam. So you're going to be, so uh, in our systematic approach to the shoulder, we're going to start with the biceps, uh, go towards the subscapularis, look at the AC joint, the subacromial bursa, the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, and the teres minor. So as I mentioned previously, the shoulder is one of those structures that you have to do a complete exam. Now for other structures, you can do a more focused exam, whether it's going to be the medial aspect, the lateral aspect, anterior, or posterior. So you can, you can be a little bit more focused and limited, but the, with the shoulder recommendations are usually to do a complete exam. So now we're gonna start our uh, shoulder demonstration. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Now we're gonna to move to the live um, sports ultrasound demonstration using the new Sonosite PX and the L15 uh, linear transducer. Um, we're gonna start on the anterior shoulder, right at the biceps. So uh, this is gonna be our home base area. So you can see the nice bright bony acoustic landmark of the proximal humerus. And this is gonna be an axial image. 
So to the left of the screen is lateral, to the right of the screen is medial. And you can see uh, even more medial, you can make out some of the coracoid. So right, it, right, there's the coracoid process. So right in the middle of the screen, we have the proximal biceps tendon, and it's in the characteristic bicipital groove. And just lateral to that, we have the greater tuberosity. So that's one bony acoustic alarm mark in medial, the biceps tendon. We have the um, lesser tuberosity. So that's where the attachment of the subscapularis on the lesser tuberosity. So this is our home base. We have the nice, bright, bony acoustic landmark of the proximal humerus. And then we can um, uh, evaluate the biceps tendon and we can move from proximal to distal. And you follow the biceps tendon down. And there's the tendon of the pectoralis major coming right over the biceps tendon here. And you can go back proximally. And then after you've evaluated in short axis, then you can rotate the probe 90 degrees and evaluate the biceps in long axis. And again, the biceps is not, it doesn't go straight up and down. It, it angles and it slants. So you have to heel toe the probe. So you can, so the probe can be placed parallel to the length of the biceps tendon. You can see you get this nice, uh, fibular pattern here when you're able to heel toe and then again you can follow the biceps proximal and from proximal to distal towards the myotendinous junction and see so you're, you're getting into the muscle belly there so then you can go back to home base and then once you've evaluated the biceps tendon then while you're in this position you can evaluate the subscapularis and to do this you'll need to do um uh, a dynamic maneuver to external, externally rotate the shoulder. And you can see the subscapularis point into view. Now this is an axial cut or a long axis along the length of the, uh, or parallel to the fibers of the subscapularis tendon. So you can make out here, these are the fibers of the, of the tendon. And then once you have this position, you can also rotate perpendicularly 90 degrees. And this is equivalent to a sagittal image that we would see on MRI. Now again, here, when you look at it in this view, in a view, um, you could see that there's the hyperechoic tendon, but there's also some interdigitation with muscles. So don't mistake in this for pathology. So as you scan back and forth, you can make out some of the interdigitation between the tendon and the muscle. So again, this is gonna be equivalent to looking at a sagittal image, or this is a short axis view of the subscapularis. So then once we've completed our evaluation of the subscapularis, then we can go up and look at the AC joint. So you can evaluate the capsule of the AC joint. You can evaluate for bony irregularities. You can also do some dynamic maneuvers to see if there's any instability of the AC joint. And then if you slide laterally to the edge of the chromium, this is where we'll get into the supraspinatus. So again, you can make out the, this is a coronal view or, or long axis of the supraspinatus. So again, we have the bony acoustic landmark of the edge of the chromium. We have the bony acoustic landmark of the uh, proximal humerus. And then you can follow that laterally to the greater tuberosity. And then you can make out the enthesis of the rotator cuff. And then as you slide proximally, then you see you get into the articular portion. And if you can see just right there, that, that's the articular portion of the rotator cuff. And then we can do dynamic maneuvers for impingement. Um, now, if you go back to that lateral view in the rotator cuff, you can make out, see that potential space or that thin hypoechoic line, just superficial to the rot. So that's actually the bursa. So the bursa is a potential space. Um, it's almost like the lining of the heart where you have a visceral and parietal pleura. So if fluid gets into that space, that's when you'll see a little bit of bursitis or thickening of the bursa. So that thin line is, is the... Is the subacromial bursa. So when you're trying to do an injection, if you if you want to have the injection placed into the bursa, you have to actually place it right into that dark hypochord region. So then here you can do a dynamic maneuver by having the patient abduct their shoulder and you're just looking to see how the rotator cuff clears the acromia. So you're looking for bunching of the bursa and if it fully clears, and you can see how the rotator cuff there fully clears uh, under the acromia. So once we've completed this, then we're going to do uh, a more thorough evaluation of the rotator cuff. Place the patient's hand in a, in a position. There's various names for this, whether it's the Middleton or Crass position. 
Uh, but basically, with this position, you're moving the rotator cuff out from under the acromion. So it can be um, uh, visualized. So again, the probe is going to be almost parallel to the long axis of the humor to visualize the rotator cuff and long axis. So this is a long axis or chronal view. So when you're in this position, you're going to slide the probe uh, from, me you want to go medial to get the most uh, uh, anterior aspect of the probe, which you use the biceps tendon as your landmark. So there's your biceps tendon, so you know, and, so, and just go slightly lateral to that. And that's, that's going to be where you're going to start. You, you want to make sure you evaluate that area. And then you can slide uh, the probe laterally and you get into the area where the uh, where the uh, supraspinatus and the in infraspinatus start coming together and you can see as the as the bony acoustic landmark starts to flatten right there you doesn't have that characteristic paired beat that's usually the area where you could tell the uh, infraspinatus is, is coming into view okay. now we're going to go from long axis to short axis by rotating rotating the probe 90 degrees so this is a short axis view of the supraspinatus here and again, we want to use our biceps tendon to make sure we uh, evaluate as far medially as we can. So there's our biceps tendon, and we have this characteristic wagon wheel appearance of the, or this is a short axis view of the supraspinatus. And then we want to follow this distally towards the greater tuberosity, so you can kind of see how the tendon will, will uh, thin out as you get towards the enthesis. So that there you have the greater tuberosity. And then the greater tuberosity has a, a multiple facets. So you can make out the superior facet, and the, the middle facet. That's uh, where the arrow is pointing to. So then once we've evaluated the rotator cuff in short axis and long axis um, of the supraspinatus, again, this, that's analogous to a sagittal MRI. We're going to relax the patient. Then we're going to go to the posterior aspect of the shoulder. And then we're going to start off with a short axis view uh, through the uh, infraspinatus and teres minor muscles. So we're going to start on the posterior part of the shoulder. The probe is going to be almost uh, parallel to the long axis of the humerus, the approximate humerus. So we're going to look for this characteristic biconcave appearance. To the left of the screen is proximal, to the right is this so you, you can make out the bony acoustic landmark of the proximal humerus, the humeral head. And then you can see that biconcave appearance. So the more proximal muscle is gonna be the infraspinatus right there. And the more distal muscle to the right of the screen is gonna be the teres minor. And then as you slide towards the tuberosity, then you'll be able to make out the central tendons of each muscle, and you can follow those towards their insertion. And if you look at the proximal there, we have, you're starting into the tendon of the teri, uh, of the, uh, excuse me, infraspinatus. And then we can also, once we find that, then we can do the same, follow the uh, muscle belly and then the central tendon of the teres minor, and we can follow that towards its insertion on the tuberosity. And then so you can find these in, in short axis, and you can go back to the infraspinatus, and then you can find the, in, and then you can follow it towards the insertion, and then you can uh, rotate the probe and uh, uh, interrogate the infraspinatus in the long axis. So Dr. Awan, do you find this to be a challenging view sometimes where the infraspinatus tucks under the acromion? Yes, definitely. That's why yes. I think sometimes it's easier to find it when um, you're following it from the, the view we just looked in short axis. And also too, when you're interrogating the supraspinatus and the sliding posteriorly, sometimes that's just an easier way to get to the infraspinatus. Sometimes you can try and find it, just find the glenohumeral humeral joint. And okay. Then you slide proximal and distal then you'll find this, the central tendon as you slide up and down. So again, you see the infraspinatus muscle there. So we have our glenohumeral glen humeral joint. So there you can make out some of it. So you can just use the, the posterior joint as, as a landmark. So there you can make out that central tendon, the infraspinatus. And then we could focus here. There's our uh, glenohumeral humeral joint. So the, to the left of the screen is medial. So that's the glenoid. To the right of the screen is the, is the proximal humerus. And then you can make out, see that hypoechoic contour on uh, so that's the articular cartilage of the proximal humerus and then you could see that uh, you could make out the joint capsule which is that hyperchoic band that goes from the humeral head to the glenoid 
and you can follow that to the glenoid. So if you're doing a glenohumeral injection, you don't have to dive deep in there. You have that triangular structure of the posterior labrum. And then we can do some dynamic maneuvers here with uh, external rotation just to evaluate for any, any fluid or whatnot in the glenohumeral joint. So when you're doing this, sometimes you may see a, a vein dilates. So you want to make sure you're not mistaking that for a cyst because you don't want to go sticking needles into a vein. And if, you, if you're sliding immediately there, you can, uh, that right there is the suprascapular nerve, nerve at the spinal glenoid notch. So that's an area where if someone has a, a paralabral cyst, they could potentially have suprascapular nerve involvement. Now, typically, if it's at this level, the spinal glenoid notch, the supraspinatus will be, will be spared, and most of their weakness will be to the infraspinatus. I think that concludes our examination of the shoulder. So now that we went over the demonstration of the shoulder and elbow, we're going to look at the posterior thigh and knee, uh, starting with the proximal hamstring and working our way distally. And then we'll also uh, briefly look at some peripheral nerves that we can encounter in this region. So this is a schematic of the hamstring. Uh, sometimes the uh, hamstring anatomy can be complicated. So if you look here on this diagram of the ischial tuberosity, so laterally we have the, lo uh, the long head of the biceps, excuse me, we have the biceps femoris, and then we have the semitendinosus muscle, and they, have, they share this conjoined tendon. And then you have the muscle of the semimembranosus, and then you have the membrane, the tendon of the semimembranosus. So when you're proximal, you don't really have muscle belly, the semimembranosus. Most of the muscle belly is the semitendinosus and the biceps femoris. And then you'll have the conjoined tendon and you'll have the membrane of the semimembranosus. You don't start seeing the semimembranosus muscle unless, unless you're uh, more distal. So we can see this here on ultrasound. So this is at the level of the gluteal crease. This is an axial or short axis view. Um, and this is the, this uh, image here is corresponding to this probe position. So it's right at the level of the gluteal crease. This is lateral, this is medial. So right here with this honeycomb structure here is the sciatic nerve. We have the biceps femoris muscle, which is here. We have the semitendinosus muscle here. Again, you can see it's more muscular here, whereas the semimembranosus doesn't come until it's distal. This structure here, this membrane is actually the membrane of the semimembranosus. And this is the tendon of the semimembranosus. So we have the muscle, the semi-T, and the tendon of the semimembranosus here. And then as we start to scan distal. So again, we slide a little medially. Again, we have the muscle, excuse me, the muscle of the semi-T, the tendon, the semimembranosus. And as we start to slide distally, then we'll start seeing the semimembranosus come into view. So this is a hamstring case. Um, this was a, a track athlete that continued to have a persistent pain after a hamstring injury and just wasn't progressing or coming along. And the, the area was near the, the mid portion of the hamstring. So we had radiographs here and really didn't see any abnormalities on the radiographs. And then here's the corresponding ultrasound. So we could see a little bit of signal here at, one of, at the myotendinous junction. But look what we have here on ultrasound. So again, one of the nice things about ultrasound, you could do side to side comparison. So this was the affected side. This was the unaffected side or the, uh, the opposite side of the control. So again, remember we're at this region of the gluteal crease. We have the, the sciatic nerve here. Here's the conjoined tendon, the biceps femoris, and the semi-T. And then again, again you can see here, there's that, this is actually early heterotopic ossification or heterotopic calcification that wasn't present on, that wasn't, we weren't able to visualize it on the MRI or the x-rays. It's actually impinging on the, on the sciatic nerve. So again, this is, uh, this is going to be lateral. This is going to be medial. This is side-to-side -side comparison. We have the biceps femoris, the semitendinosus. We have the membrane of the semimembranosus, the sciatic nerve, and then the conjoint tendon is up here. So we can rotate the probe on long axis and, and look at it along the uh, a long axis view of the sciatic nerve. So you can see the sciatic nerve is here, and you have this early heterotrophic ossification actually impinging on the sciatic nerve here. So again, you know, the soft tissue resolution and the, and the ability to pick up this type of early uh, heterotopic ossification that wasn't visualized on either MRI or um, X-ray. So now we're gonna get into the posterior thigh and knee demonstration. I think patient modesty is gonna be important. So anytime you can cover an area, you wanna try and cover the areas you're not gonna be scanning as best as you can. And the patients are going to be a little bit anxious, they're in pain, and then they're having 
a test or anything uh, that can make the patient uh, feel a little bit more comfortable will go a long way. Also, another thing to, to be cognizant of is of, of the scanner and the patient over opposite sex. It may be worthwhile to have a patient advocate in the room as well, especially when you're scanning your sensitive areas. So when you start with um, uh, the proximal hamstring, um, I think a good area to start is in the, in the area near the gluteal crease. And then you'll, you'll often hear this uh, term, the Mercedes-Benz sign. Again, you have this almost looks like a Mercedes-Benz symbol here. So I think this is a good, uh, good starting point. So if you um, slide the probe laterally, slightly, there you go. You can see that structure. So there's, this is gonna be the Mercedes-Benz sign. So you can almost make it out. So that structure there in the center of the screen is gonna be the sciatic nerve right there. So the, so the left side of the screen is lateral to the right side of the screen is medial. So we have the sciatic nerve. To the left is the muscle of the biceps femoris. So that's gonna be the lateral muscle there. You have the sciatic nerve and then in gen superficial to the sciatic nerve, almost above it, you make that hyperechoic structure. That's actually gonna be the conjoint tendon of the um, biceps femoris and the semitendinosus. And then if you slide medially, you have the muscle of the semi-T. So that's the semi-T muscle. And then the, the membrane that's inferior deep to the semi-T muscle, that's actually the membrane of the semimembranosus. And then that structure right there at the arrow is the actually the tendon of the semimembranosus. So at this point, the you're actually the semimembranosus is more membranous or, or tendon here. You really don't make out any of the muscle belly. So all the muscle belly you see here is the semitendinosus. So if you go immediately, slide the probe immediately, that's all membrane of the semimembranosus. And then that's all muscle belly of the semi-T. And then as you start to scan distally, then you make out the muscle belly of the semimembranosus on the medial aspects of you, of you uh, focus to the medial aspect of the semitendinosus muscle. Uh, we can go a little bit more medial there to get the, and then if we scan distally, that's when then we'll start, we'll start to make out the muscle belly of the semimembranosus. Right there. It starts off as just right there. There's the muscle belly of the semimembranosus there. So again, this is a good start. So let's go back to our home base of the Mercedes-Benz sign. So again, this is a good area to start. You have the conjoint tendon. You have the uh, semimembranosus medially tendon, and that's all membrane. And then there's the semitendinosus muscle. Again, the, the muscle belly of the semimembranosus won't come in until you go uh, more distal. And then you can, you can make up the muscle belly there. And then, uh, and then we have the lateral muscle is going to be the biceps femoris. So again, it's really easy to get confused with the anatomy. So use your home base of that Mercedes-Benz to, to start and orient yourself. And then you can, you can follow the, the structures proximally distally. And if you go back to the conjoint tendon here, you can follow it proximally till it inserts on the, on the ischial tuberosity. Now, the uh, interesting thing of the tendon is if you go distally, so you want to pay attention. So go back distally to the Mercedes-Benz starting point. So you have the conjoint tendon and then the tendon of the semimembranosus, right? So the conjoint tendon here is a little bit more lateral. The semimembranosus is a little bit more medial. Now, as you move proximally towards the ischial tuberosity, now some patients, you actually make them out closer to the tuberosity, but they're actually going to crisscross. So if you look here, let's see if we can, as we move proximally, they'll crisscross and the semimembranosus will be more lateral. And then the conjoint tendon is going to be more medial when it attaches on the ischial tuberosity. So again, we have the bony acoustic landmark of the ischial tuberosity there. And then you have the hyperechoic uh, conjoint tendon and semimembranosus uh, tendons attaching on that ischial tuberosity. So again, that's going to be the hamstring tendon and short axis. And then we can rotate the probe. So again, if, uh, before that, actually, let's go back and if you just slide back and forth and just try to pay attention to the, to the orientation between the conjoint tendon and the semimembranosus tendon as they attach. You can see here the semimembranosus is starting to go medially to the tendon. So it's gonna, it's gonna attach more laterally on the ischial tuberosity. So they, they actually crisscross as, as you go proximally. So again, you have the bright hyperechoic tendon, hamstring tendon and short axis. And then we can rotate the probe 90 degrees and we can evaluate the hamstring tendon and long axis. And again, you have the bony acoustic landmark of the ischial tuberosity, and you can see the nice hyperechoic fibular structure of the uh, hamstring tendon and long axis.
and the same. You can follow the, um, you can evaluate the sciatic and you can see the nice uh, filamentous structure of the nerve. And you can follow this approximately and, and distally. And you can follow it distally till it branches. You're going to follow the nerve distally and you look at branches, best to look at it. So if you want to look at the branching of the nerves into the um, perineal and tibial branch, we can actually follow the sciatic nerve down. So we'll go ahead, go ahead and follow it. And the nerves in the center of the screen right there. There we yep. go. You can see if you windshield, now you with nerves, you want to windshield, once you see it, you want to windshield back and forth quickly because when you move quickly, you actually see it better once you get to the area of branching. So you can make out to the lateral portion of the screen is going to be the perineal nerve. And that's the tibial nerve to the right of the, or the medial aspect of the screen. So the perineal nerve is going to go superficial. But if you scan back and forth quickly, you can see just going back and forth, you can really see that nicely how they're branching off. So kind of doing this quick scan back and forth sometimes can be helpful in, in uh, visualizing these nerves. So again, you can follow each nerve distally. The, you know, we can keep following, let's focus on the perineal nerve and follow that. All right, I'm gonna follow it. So here it is here. I'm gonna bring my depth up more shallow. So it's gonna be in the posterior lateral aspect of the knee in this area, medial to the biceps femoris. And then it'll kind of loop around and you can, you can make out, if you follow it, then it's gonna, you know, you're gonna be in the region of the fibular head. So here, now you're actually in the femoral condyle. So you can make out the articular cartilage of the femoral condyle. So you yeah. have the perineal nerve, the femoral condyle and the biceps femoris muscle. And then if you keep following it distally, then it's gonna, you're gonna reach the area. And there's actually the lateral head of the gastroc to the right. And then if you keep yeah. following it, uh, the nerve distally, and eventually reach uh, the area where it crosses the fibular head. And you can make out there the proximal portion of the fibular head there. So you can see that very nicely. And then we can follow it back proximally to See nicely, you can go back to where, where it connects with the tibial nerve to form the sciatic proper. So then if we go back to home base, we can follow the, um, so there again, you have the uh, uh, tibial nerve to the right or medial and the perineal nerve to the left or lateral. So very nice, you see them uh, branching. So we go follow that approximately and we go back to our home base or the Mercedes-Benz sign. Yeah, I noticed it, dive, it dove on me again. So here it is down here deep. Oh, you're from, I'm sorry, you're from distally. So we're following it distally. So now I'm back up. Yep. Going yep. for going for Mercedes. Back to the sciatic nerve. Now we can also follow the uh, muscle bellies as well. So we go, once again, start at the home base, and then we focus okay. on the biceps femoris, which is going to be lateral. Okay. okay. Follow it distally as well, the biceps femoris muscle. So this guy here. Yep. You can keep yeah. an eye here because um, there you can make out the short head and the long head. So if you keep so following, you follow the biceps the femoris. Bicep. All of this guy here. So that's the, the superficial portion is going to be the long head, and then that almost rectangular portion is going to be the short head as you go right in that area. And then I see the uh, bifurcation happen here, right as we notice the long and short head. Yep. There's the long and short head of the biceps femoris, yep. And then you can make out the bifurcation. There's our nerve. Boom, it splits right there, really nice. Now, typically when I'm looking at the tendons, the hamstring tendons, or um, I usually like to either start proximal in the gluteal crease where we just looked at or behind the knee. Sometimes it could be uh, tough to get it oriented if you're starting in the middle of the thigh. So I usually like to start uh, in the posterior knee or at the 
proximal portion at the uh, Mercedes Benz area. So again, we make out the, uh, there's a pulsating vessel. And to the left of the screen is lateral. We can make out the lateral femoral condyle because you can see the characteristic contour and then the hypochoic stripe of the articular cartilage. So we have the lateral uh, femoral condyle and then we have the medial femoral condyle to the right of the screen. So again, you have the medial femoral condyle and then we have uh, the nice pulsating artery. So this is gonna be where the neurovascular structures are in the tibial nerve in this region, the posterior. So you can make out the uh, artery and the tibial nerve just next to it. So again, you see the vein with compression. So if Daniel lightens up the pressure there, you can see the vein. So again, you have the tibial nerve, the vein and the artery in the posterior. So we go near the area of the medial femoral condyle, we actually wanna find our semimembranosus tendon. So we're gonna look for our semi-membranosis tendon and our medial gastroc, because those are gonna be landmarks for looking at Baker cysts. So you can see the muscle belly there, it looks like the medial head of the gastroc. So the medial head of the gastroc has a tendon and you can make out that hyperechoic tendon right there. And then you see that, see what Daniel did with the anisotropy. So there was a structure just right of that. You see how that, so that's a, that's a nice little tool to use to find the semi-membranosis tendon is using anisotropy. So you look there, that. So just by angling of the probe, so there's the hyperechoic stripe of the semi-membranosus tendon. And then superficial to it is actually the tendon of the semi-T or the semi-tendinosus is superficial, just to the a little bit more medial to that. So there, so the medial part is gonna be the, uh, on the medial part. So you have the semi-T and then, and then you have the semi-membranosus tendon. Now the semi-membranosus tendon doesn't go to the pes, so it attaches to the posterior tibia. So if we rotate the probe and long axis, we're gonna have a nice uh, landmark here with the bony acoustic landmark of the uh, 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 femoral condyle. And then we can make out the attachment. And there we have, so again, we have to the left of the screen is proximal, to the right is distal. So you have the contour of the bony acoustic landmark of the medial femoral condyle. That hypochoic stripe is actually the articular cartilage. And then that hyperechoic fibular structure that goes over the joint again. So you have the femoral condyle and then you have the, the, um, uh, the tibia to the right of the screen. And then the structure in between is actually the posterior horn, the medial meniscus. So you have all those in the, so those are all nice landmarks. And then the hyperechoic fibular structure that attaches on the posterior tibia is gonna be the semimembranosus tendon. So again, you can use your uh, bony acoustic landmarks to help you find uh, the center member knows this tendon long axis because you'll have both the femur and tibia in view and the posterior horn and the medial meniscus so you can follow it distally uh, to its insertion. You can see that nicely, the insertion there, the uh, center member knows this tendon. And then we go back to short axis at the Baker cyst area. So again, the Baker cyst is of its, by definition, Baker cyst has to originate from this region in between the semi membranosus tendon and the uh, medial head of the gastroc. So this is gonna be the area where you look for Baker cysts. And we can follow um, uh, these tendons proximally as well. So if you follow the semi-tendinosis tendon proximally, you can see that it's kind of opposite with, as you were in the blue teal or hamstring region, you don't, it's more of a tendon strip of the semi-tendinosis the more uh, muscle of the semi-membranosis, and if you start getting more proximal, that's when you get into the muscle of the uh, semi-T. So again, you see there, so if you go slide from proximal to distal, let's go distal towards the tendon. Go distal, there you go. So there's the tendon, and then, and then the muscle actually is semi-membranosis, and then as you start to go proximal, that's when you start getting into the muscle of the semi-T. Very nice image there. And so we looked at the uh, semi-T and the semi-membranosis. Uh, the other, if we move laterally now, so there we have the semi-membranosis on the femoral condyle. If we move laterally now, we can, uh, the other uh, structure we're looking at is the biceps femoris. So we look at the biceps femoris attachment here on the uh, fibular head. Now, one way you can look at it is actually you can start on the lateral knee, find the joint line. 
So let's go to the lateral knee. So you can look at it. So, so this is a way of looking at it from the side. So this is using bony acoustic landmarks. So if you find the lateral knee. So you can palpate the fibular head. So again, that's a nice picture. So to the left of the screen is proximal, to the right of the screen is distal. You can make out the, the fibular head to the right of the screen. And then you have the, actually you can make a, a portion of the tibia and a portion of the fibula to the more proximal to the right. And that nice hyperopoic fibula. So that's a very nice view of the, of the uh, uh, biceps femoris. That includes our webinar. Now we'll open up the floor for, for a Q&A session.